Hey there, friends. Pastor Jason here. Glad you could join me for Daily Devotionals. We're still in Job, and we're, today we're going to wrap up Elihu's arguments with Job. Um, remember, Elihu is the fourth friend. Um, he, Elihu was the youngest of them and had waded through uh, all of their arguments before he spoke. And he is different. He sounds like he sounds like the other three friends, but the other three friends were looking to condemn Job. And here, Elihu's got problems with what Job had to say because Job was trying to sanctify himself rather than sanctifying the Lord. And he was upset with the friends because they weren't able to put those pieces together. Um, Elihu is hoping for Job's reconciliation with the Lord, and he's going to um, stand up for God's sovereignty. I'm sorry, I've got my notes here. Um, I want to make sure I say it all right, because at the end of the day, Job is a difficult book, and uh, hopefully I'm, I'm making this easier as we're going through. Let's get into the last half of Elihu's arguments, and then we'll kind of sum up what he had to say. Starting in chapter 35, verse 1. Then Elihu continued saying, Do you think it is just when you say, I am righteous before God? For you ask, What does it profit you, and what benefit comes to me if I do not sin? I will answer you, and your friends with you. Look at the heavens and see. Gaze at the clouds high above you. If you sin, how does it affect God? If you multiply your transgressions, what does it do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness affects a person like yourself, and your righteousness another human being. People cry out because of severe oppression. They shout for help because of the arm of the mighty. But no one asks, where is God my maker, who provides us with songs in the night, who gives us more understanding than the animals of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of the sky? There they cry out, but he does not answer because of the pride of evil men. Indeed, God does not listen to empty cries and the Almighty does not take note of it. How much less when you complain that you do not see him, that your case is before him and you are waiting for him. But now, because of God's anger, does not punish and he does not pay attention to transgression, Job opens his mouth in vain and multiplies words without knowledge. Then Elihu continued saying, chapter 36, Be patient with me a little longer and I will inform you, for there is still more to be said on God's behalf. I will get my knowledge from a distant place and ascribe justice to my maker. For my arguments are without flaw, one who has perfect knowledge is with you. Yes, God is mighty, but he despises no one. He understands all things. He does not keep the wicked alive, but he gives justice to the afflicted. He does not remove his gaze from the righteous, but he seats them forever with enthroned kings, and they are exalted. If people are bound with chains or entrapped by the cords of affliction, God tells them what they have done and how arrogantly they have transgressed. He opens their ears to correction and insists they repent from iniquity. If they serve him obediently, they will end their days in prosperity and their years in happiness. But if they do not obey, they will cross the river of death and die without knowledge. Those who have a godless heart harbor anger. Even when God binds them, they do not cry for help. They die in their youth. Their life ends among male cult prostitutes. God rescues the afflicted by their affliction. He instructs them by their torment. Indeed, he lured you from the jaws of distress to a spacious and unconfined place. Your table was spread with choice food, yet now you are obsessed with the judgment due the wicked. Judgment and justice have seized you. Be careful that no one lures you with riches. Do not let a large ransom lead you astray. Can your wealth or all your physical exertion keep you from distress? Do not long for the night when nations will disappear from their places. 
Be careful that you do not turn to iniquity, for that is why you've been tested by affliction. Look, God shows himself exalted by his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has appointed his way for him? And who has declared, you have done wrong? Remember that you should praise his work, which people have sung about. All mankind has seen it. People have looked at it from a distance. Yes, God is exalted beyond our knowledge. The number of his years cannot be counted. For he makes water drops evaporate. They distill the rain into its mist, which clouds pour out and shower abundantly on mankind. Can anyone understand how the clouds spread out? Or how the thunder roars from God's pavilion? See how he spreads his lightning around him and covers the depth of his sea. He judges the nations with these. He gives food in abundance. He covers his hand with lightning and commands it to hit its mark. The thunder declares his presence. The cattle also the approaching storm. And chapter 37. My heart pounds at this and leaps from my chest. Just listen to his thunderous voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He let loose beneath the entire sky, his lightning to the ends of the earth. Then there comes a roaring sound. God thunders with his majestic voice. He does not restrain the lightning when his rumbling voice is heard. God thunders marvelously with his voice. How does he, excuse me, he does great things that we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, fall to the earth and the torrential rains his mighty torrential rains serve as a sign to all mankind so that all men may know his work the wild animals enter their lairs and stay in their dens the wind storm comes from its chamber and the cold from the driving north winds ice is formed by the breath of god and the watery expanses are frozen he saturates clouds with moisture. He scatters the lightning through them. They swirl about, turning round and round at his direction, accomplishing everything he commands them over the surface of the inhabited world. He causes this to happen for punishment for his land or for his faithful love. Listen to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. Do you know how God directs his clouds or makes their lightning flash? Do you understand how the clouds float? Those wonderful works of him who has perfect knowledge? You whose clothes got, get hot when the south wind brings calm to the land. Can you help God spread out the skies as hard as a cast metal mirror? Teach us that we should say to him, we cannot prepare our case because of our darkness. Should he be told that I want to speak? Can a man speak when he is confused? Now men cannot even look at the sun when it's in the skies, after a wind has swept through and cleared them away. Yet out of the north he comes, shrouded in a golden glow. Awesome majesty surrounds him. The Almighty, we cannot reach him. He is exalted in power. He will not oppress justice and abundant righteousness. Therefore men fear him. He does not look favorably on any who are wise in heart. Oh, Elihu finishes up his argument against Job. I've got some notes here, so I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, he makes this case for God's sovereignty, that God is in control. He, he knows it. There's nothing we can do to bring to him to make a case against him. Um, and... Interestingly, his error, uh, that Job's error that Elihu is pointing out, was threefold in the three chapters we just read. Um, that Job said that religion was unprofitable. Well, that's not true. He said that God is deaf to the oppressed. Again, not true. I mean, he's going to, some of that uh, recompense is going to happen after we die. So we've got to keep that in mind. And thirdly, God's favor, Job was complaining that God's favor was deferred so long that it was uh, unrighteous of the Lord. Well, also not true, okay? And Elihu makes this case through 
the natural world order of nature, right? And if we are willing to, and this is Elihu's argument, if we are willing to submit to the weather, something we don't understand, nor can we control, but we submit to it and we deal with it the best we can, making the most of it, why shouldn't we also um, do likewise with the changes in our own condition, with the changes in our own lives that we don't have any control over and frankly, maybe we don't understand. We should still honor the Lord because it's just another showing of his power. Our own humility amidst the trial is vitally important, right? Just because weather hits us doesn't mean like things are going to be prosperous. I mean, hurricane can tear down your house and you wind up, you know, like you saw the power of the Lord. So when we have something like a hurricane hit our own lives, we should see it as a power of the Lord and humbly submit to the testing he's giving us, seeing if we will again give him all honor and glory, even though it is difficult to do so. Don't forget, we get to read, uh, next coming is going to be God's response. And we're going to see that he doesn't address Elihu. So he doesn't correct him. He's the only one that the Lord doesn't correct. So take that for whatever you will. For me, I'm going to take that as, I'm going to pay attention to these last six chapters to see what Elihu was really bringing about. And I'm going to see how I can better uh, give God the sovereignty in life that he is so richly deserves, the honor and the glory of, that surround his sovereignty. I'm going to try my best to ascribe to him glory and majesty. Hey, with that, be blessed, be a blessing, and I'll see you tomorrow as God responds here in the book of Job.